Have you ever heard somebody say to you something like, I don't believe in God, I believe in science? Or as one Oxford professor once put it to me, he said, science has buried God. In other words, you religious people are just idiots and you need to catch up. Okay, that's a pretty harsh way of putting it, but yes, it's certainly true that there are many people who believe that science and religion essentially contradict each other. For what it's worth, I myself wouldn't make such a grand statement that science has buried God, but I do think that some specific discoveries from science have undermined some specific religious claims, for sure. For example, the pre-Victorian view that God created animals just as they are today from scratch and made humans as beings separate from the rest of the animal kingdom was undermined by evolutionary biology. Likewise, the historicity of the Jewish exodus from Egypt has been undermined by archaeology, which has discovered precisely zero evidence that the Israelites were even enslaved there in the first place. But these kinds of specific beliefs are Christian claims, Jewish claims. They're totally separate from, say, the ontological argument for the abstract existence of God, about which science has absolutely nothing to say. So whilst science can undermine some religions, I don't think it can single-handedly undermine religion as a whole. But here we have Dr. Andy Bannister claiming not only that science doesn't undermine religion, but that it in fact can't undermine religion. Not just this, but he claims that science doesn't even make sense at all if you're not a Christian. And that's Christianity specifically, not just a belief in God in general. That is to say, he thinks science can't undermine Christianity because science requires Christianity. Now, this may sound implausible at first, and, well, yeah, that's just because it is. But before we jump into things, if you're new here, my name's Alex O'Connor, and if this isn't the first time you've seen me, it's just a sign that you should be subscribed. And click the notification bell if you want updates when new videos become available. Many people think that science and Christianity are entirely at war with each other, and if you're going to be a scientist, you have to forget about something as uh, superstitious as Christianity. I want to suggest something to you, though, totally radically different to that. What about the idea that Christianity is actually the only firm foundation from which you can do science? See? I wasn't exaggerating. Remember, here's the thing being discussed, that science undermines Christianity, that it disproves many of its claims. Let's see why Dr. Bannister thinks that this is untrue. You see, let's consider two worldviews for a moment. We have Christianity, we have atheism. Which best explains science? Well, it's interesting that all of the founding fathers of science who first got the scientific method going, they were all Christians. Why? Because they believed in a God who was rational and coherent, and who had created a world that was rational and coherent and logical, and therefore you could investigate it expecting to find pattern and order. It's absolutely true that most of the founding fathers of science, our Galileos, our Isaac Newtons, our Charles Darwins, were believers in God. But so was everyone at the time. Indeed, if science does undermine religion, then of course the founding fathers of science were religious, since if they were the inventors of science, then science didn't yet exist to undermine religion. I mean, think about it. Assume for a moment that science does undermine religion. The men who founded the scientific disciplines that went on to undermine religion must have been living in a time before those scientific disciplines existed, right? Because they invented them. So these men, living in the time right when the modern scientific method was invented, believed in God because the science that would go on to undermine their religion hadn't yet been invented. Trying to disprove that science undermines religion by saying that the inventors of science were religious is like pointing out that the inventor of the car used to walk around everywhere. Of course he did, the car didn't exist yet, and even when he brought it into existence, it wasn't universally used until a while afterwards. Now, you may still ask though, why did these founders of science stay religious after they had invented science? Well, it's not like they just invented science and then all of a sudden all of its discoveries were laid bare. It's a more drawn out process than that. They put the methods in place, but the discoveries made using them didn't come until later. Not until modern science had been invented and had been in use for some time to make discoveries could it begin to undermine the religious beliefs of the people who invented it. So we shouldn't expect them to have simply and immediately given up their religious beliefs, even if science does undermine religion. But honestly, maybe the discoveries of these classic scientists did shake their faith. Maybe some never experienced such doubts. 
let's look at the evidence and find out. And just to be clear, throughout investigating this subject, I'm not even trying to claim that science does undermine religion. I'm just saying that the response Dr. Andy Bannister proposes to the claim that science undermines religion isn't very good. So let's start with Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton is one founder who definitely never lost his faith. But in all matters separate from his physics, he seemed to be a rather strange and frantic individual. He spent more time analysing the Bible and attempting alchemy than he spent inventing calculus. He was obsessed with occult practices like searching for the elixir of life and the philosopher's stone so that he could turn mercury into gold. And he thought that he'd discovered secret messages in the Bible, including, by the way, that the world will come to an end no earlier than the year 2060. So that's something to look forward to, I guess. Newton was also, by most accounts, not a Trinitarian. That is, not someone who believed in the Holy Trinity. He was an Arian, holding to the heretical belief that the Son, Jesus, is subordinate to the Father. But even so, from the evidence we have, I'm not so sure we should be taking Newton's religious views very seriously anyway. <laughs> Next, Galileo. Now, I have a whole video on this man and his conflicts with the Catholic establishment, but in a letter to the Grand Duchess Christina of Tuscany, Galileo argued that Christianity is true, but perhaps needs to be reinterpreted to allow for the discoveries of science. Specifically, Galileo's belief that the Earth orbits the Sun, not the other way round, as was generally believed at the time. That is, he recommended, based on science, a slight change to the Christian doctrine of the time. And the Church responded by saying, good point. We love science and would be glad to take your input on board. Oh, sorry, wait, no, they didn't. They threatened him with torture, ordered him to never speak publicly about his beliefs, and eventually falsified evidence against him in court to place him under house arrest for the remainder of his life. Do you think that that might have something to do with the fact that Galileo never publicly questioned his Christian faith? Under these conditions, right, with the Inquisition displaying its instruments of torture and threatening to use them on people who express heretical beliefs, just about anybody would claim to be a Christian. And this is exactly what the Catholic Church did to Galileo in 1633. On to Charles Darwin. Darwin wrote to his friend John Fordyce in 1879 that whilst he didn't call himself an atheist in the sense of denying God's existence, the older he got, the more he liked to call himself an agnostic. That is, not a Christian. And Darwin may also have been scared, just like Galileo, to publicly announce any doubts that he might have had about religion. The letter I just quoted was a private one, not a public writing. When The Origin of Species was published, it was met with considerable backlash from the religious who thought it was heretical. So much so, in fact, that Darwin felt compelled to change the text of its final chapter in response. Take a look. The original ending to The Origin of Species reads as follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been, and are being, evolved. One of the most beautiful passages in the English language, I hope you'll agree, but now look at the same text from the second edition of the book, published in 1860. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and so on and so forth. Darwin added in this Creator to his work to appease the religious fanatics who just couldn't accept that maybe the origin of species on planet Earth can be explained without reference to God. Now, how do we know that Darwin didn't simply have a change of heart and include this creator due to his own devotion? Well, because he removed it again from later editions of the book after the controversy had died down. Thankfully, the version you can buy today stays true to this original, godless text. So, sure, the founding fathers of science were religious, but they were so before science had reached its modern potential and were threatened with public shame or torture and imprisonment if they contradicted Christianity. It's not a history that I, if I were a Christian, would be particularly proud of. But look, we can, apparently, push even further. But we can push even further. 
What's the best way of explaining why we should do science in the first place? If you're an atheist, perhaps the best you can do is you might say, well, look at the outcomes. I'm researching a cure for cancer, or for folk music appreciation, or one of those wonderful things. You can justify your science. You know, my science benefits humankind. But I had a friend a few years ago whose PhD was in the mating habits of a particular type of ant in the Amazonian rainforests. And I would ask her, why are you doing this? And her answer was always the same. She would say, well, I'm doing it because it's interesting. It's just a good thing to uncover truth. I think she's absolutely right. But that's a Christian answer, not an atheist answer, because it assumes that pursuing truth is a good thing in and its own right. On atheism, why is it good to know what is true? It's hard to answer that question. Yikes. A uh, few things. First, science is nothing more than a method used for uncovering truths and making predictions about future events. Dr. Bannister is saying that an atheist has no reason to pursue science since there's no way to ground the idea that pursuing truth is a good thing. But remember the claim he's responding to, that science undermines Christianity. Let me just grant completely that an atheist has absolutely no reason to do science. This doesn't mean that if they decide to do science anyway, that science can't undermine Christianity. If an atheist proves scientifically that a religious claim is false, you're welcome to ask, well, why were you bothering to do science in the first place as an atheist? But you can't say something like, because you had no good reason to conduct this scientific investigation as an atheist, I won't accept its conclusions. Whether or not science can undermine Christianity has nothing to do with whether a person has a proper motive for doing science. Even if they don't have a proper motive, this doesn't invalidate any of the discoveries that they make. Imagine, by analogy, that my friend makes a claim. Let's say that he claims that it's impossible to build a house with more than three stories. Now suppose that I'm someone who has absolutely no reason to want to build a house. I don't want a house, I already have a house, and I can't afford another one. Still, for no good reason, I decide to build a house anyway, and I make it with four stories. I then say to my friend, hey look, your belief was wrong. Now imagine my friend responded by saying, what? You had no reason to build that house in the first place. You're not in a position to say that my belief is wrong. I mean, okay, maybe I didn't have a good reason to build the house, but that doesn't change the fact that when I did, it disproved your belief, right? I might have no reason to do science as an atheist, but that doesn't change the fact that when I do, if it disproves Christianity, it disproves Christianity. And so far, I've just kind of granted this idea that there's no good reason for an atheist to do science. But I don't even think that's true, right? Atheists feel pain and suffer and recognize that the science of medicine will alleviate that suffering. They get bored and like being social and recognize that the science of technology can help with those things. They get curious and want to know about the universe and science can obviously help with that too. Right? Even if they lack some objective reason to argue that pursuing truth is always a good thing, they can still retain a subjective desire to do so anyway. And besides, why should Christianity give us any better reason to think that pursuing truth is a good thing? Well, here's Dr. Bannister. On atheism, why is it good to know what is true? It's hard to answer that question. For Christians, on the other hand, we believe in a God who is truth itself, the source of all truth. And pursuing truth is therefore good in and of its own right, because it reflects the character of God. But more than that, science sits on something much deeper. And in fact, science points to something much deeper. Pursuing truth reflects the character of God? Is this the same God who chastised Job for asking him to explain why he was being made to suffer, asserting that Job simply isn't in a position to know such things? The same God whose followers on earth needed for centuries to threaten people with torture, imprisonment, or death for trying to pursue, shall we say, the wrong truth, those truths which didn't accord with Christianity? The same God whose truth becomes less and less obvious the more and more we learn about the nature of the universe? I'm not so sure that pursuing truth is reflective of this kind of being. Look, the question at hand is whether science undermines Christianity. And it's simply inappropriate to respond to this by saying, well, us Christians are the only ones who should be doing science anyway, so science can't undermine God. That doesn't make sense. Even if you are the only ones who have a good reason to do science, that doesn't mean that when an atheist decides to do it anyway, his findings are invalid. The scientific method doesn't care why you're using it. That won't affect what it uncovers. One further problem too, for trying to ground science on atheism. Science sits on the foundation that 
telling the truth about your results is a good thing. It's not considered good in science to lie about your findings, to fudge your statistics, perhaps to get that research grant or that publication in the journal that you're lusting after. But why is it wrong to lie about your results? That's an ethical statement that science itself can't ground. This is, to be frank, completely bizarre and utterly irrelevant. Science can't prove that lying is wrong, no. But it doesn't claim to. It only claims to show what's provably true. Sure, a scientist can lie about their findings, but even if an atheist can't say this is wrong, for whatever reason, it doesn't change the fact that these findings will be just descriptively false. Dr. Bannister is saying, lying is considered a bad thing in science, but the act of science can't justify that lying is bad. But this is like saying, using poison is considered a bad thing in the act of cooking food, but the act of cooking food can't justify that it's bad to use poison. Right, but who cares? Right, nobody thinks that it does. The ethical standards of science, or making food for that matter, are externally imposed. Nobody claims that they originate from within science or cooking itself, and so criticising them for not doing so is a curious move, and one that has nothing to do with the incompatibility of scientific findings, honestly presented or not, and religion, which is the question we began with. But there's another incompatibility that you should also be concerned about, and that's the incompatibility between unprotected web browsing and internet security. That's right. I want to take a moment to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's video. Your freedom to browse the internet safely and securely is at risk if you don't use a VPN. Every time that you connect to an unencrypted Wi-Fi network, hackers on that same network can steal your data, your passwords, your financial information, even your emails. And with so many of us working from home at the moment, some of us are regularly handling sensitive and confidential information for work purposes on our personal computers without the usual support of an office IT department. Your data is at an increased risk of being stolen by hackers if you're not on top of your internet security and using a VPN. Not only this, but when you browse the web without ExpressVPN, even using incognito mode, your internet service provider can see every website you visit. In my country, these providers are required by law to keep a log of the websites that I visit as well, which is troubling to say the least. ExpressVPN encrypts your data by rerouting through a different server and stops all of this from happening. ExpressVPN also allows you to change your location online, allowing you to access shows and movies that aren't available in your country. This is one of my favorite perks of using ExpressVPN. I can watch US Netflix despite living in the UK. For instance, I'm now able to watch Leah Remini's documentary on Scientology. So if you want a whole three months of this completely for free, then click the link in the description, expressvpn.com forward slash cosmic skeptic and secure your safety when browsing online. I also want to say a huge thanks to my supporters on Patreon, especially my top tier patrons, without whom I simply couldn't do what I do. If you like my videos, please do consider becoming a supporter at patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic. But as always, I've been Alex O'Connor. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.